live. We're back at with the Coverager podcast. Um, I am in the Coverager podcast studios in Naples, Florida. We are about to go back into uh, quarantine and self isolation. Kind of feels that way. So I'm, I have like COVID hair part two. So I did get like a real haircut, but I feel like I'm going back to COVID hair. So I think that's just going to be 2020. So you're going to have to deal with it. Um, on this episode, uh, we're going to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart uh, as a person who's really into natural catastrophes and climate related um, exposures and losses for the insurance industry. In this episode, we're going to talk about wildfire. Uh, Tammy Schwartz is my guest. And so, Tammy, happy, uh, happy Independence Day weekend to you. Hi, thank you. Happy to you. Happy Fourth of July. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, Tammy, I start uh, all of these podcasts with an, uh, allowing my guests to have the opportunity to introduce themselves. So, Tammy, why don't you talk about you and your firm? Uh, excellent. I have um, kind of a unique history. I call myself an escapee from the insurance industry. After a couple of, industry, a couple of decades on the carrier side, I've kind of jumped ship and join the insure tech firms. Uh, initially, it was just to help the insure tech companies create a kind of a proposal that the insurance carriers can understand and quickly adopt. Mm -hmm. um, and then throughout that, I've kind of um, developed some expertise and created our own sort of insure tech product in addition to our consulting. Yeah. So, name of your firm. Black Swan Analytics. Okay, which I love and we're going to go into. It's not a word we use enough. And um, as, an, as an escapee, which I greatly admire because I'm an escapee as well, you're solving a uh, really big problem. So um, why wildfire? Why, why, why did that become a focus for you? Largely because of my experience at the Fair Plan. So okay. as the VP of Underwriting and Operations at the Fair Plan and 2017 and 2018, interestingly enough, those were the two worst years in the Fair Plan's history. <laughs> and so I think I was able to see firsthand the, the devastation of the wildfires of 2017 and 2018, which really hurt the industry, but hurt our customers and you know, people that I spoke to on a daily basis had a huge impact. And so uh, for, the, for the audience that doesn't understand, can you explain some of the logistics of the California Fair Plan? What makes the California Fair Plan so much different than a prototypical insurance carrier? So the, I think the main differentiator is that the, ins the California Fair Plan is backed by the insurance industry. And so they are the only carrier in California that is immune from solvency. So they can't go bankrupt, they, they can't go insolvent. And their policies will always be good and there will always be money to pay for however many losses the fair plan has. Yeah, so I, I always think of the fair plan as the insurer of last resort, which means um, most of the time, the property owner has searched high and low uh, or the broker or agent has searched high and low and have come up empty and they really have no other choice except to put it with the fair plan. And there are pros and cons to that. So uh, this is not necessarily talk about the politics of that, but what's interesting is every time there's um, wildfire issues that occur in California, the, uh, that prototypical carrier that's writing business in California may decide to pack up and leave or stop writing in a particular area or significantly change the coverages that they might be offering, uh, which could make it extremely disadvantageous for a property owner to continually uh, be insured with that. Uh, but the fair plan has to take them. So they're, uh, they're likely to have a book of business that's highly sensitive to uh, stuff that insurers typically don't want to be sensitive to. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's definitely the case. In fact, each year, the Fair Plan reminds their customers that they should shop around, that there's probably better coverage someplace else if they can find a way to become insurable. Yeah. 
so can you talk, can you talk about uh, some of the um, hazard characteristics of wildfire specifically since you were in California? I know, I know we're going to be talking about black swan and, and a little bit, you know, something more far reaching across the country, but talk about some of the characteristics that make it so difficult to be insurable uh, for the hazard of California wildfire? Well, for the insurer, from, from the carrier's perspective, it's difficult for them to determine uh, which policies are more susceptible to wildfire risk than others and to predict how much loss that's, that's going to have. The, I think the biggest challenge with wildfire insurance is that you have to price it for the long term. So you have to have 100 years of history to figure out where the wildfire is likely to occur. And there's just not, not, a, not, not a lot of data, historical data to use to predict future wildfires. Yeah. So uh, the name of your firm is Black Swan Analytics, which I yeah. love. I'm surprised more people don't understand what that word means. Can you describe what a black swan is? Yeah, a black swan event is basically an event that happens that's really devastating or really amazing that you think will never happen. And then once it happens, you're like, oh God, we should have seen that happen. Yeah. We should have seen that coming. Yeah. Yeah. And a good example is the, um, the Katrina the event with the, the failure of the levees, you know, was something that everybody thought this would never happen. But then after it happened, it was like, of course it would have happened. We've had damage and we've had these recommendations to repairs and hurricanes happen. So we should have seen it. Yeah. So uh, your, your firm um, is, is called Black Swan. So it is, uh, I'm assuming, creating a set of analytics that will help uh, prevent black swans. So it's to help insurers, or maybe maybe you go beyond insurers. You can clarify for me. Um, get beyond, help them understand these um, essentially situations where they might be um, figuratively sitting on a powder keg, and they they right. don't realize it. Right. I think the the campfire in Paradise is a perfect example of a Black Swan event because they had, this was a community who was prepared, who practiced evacuating twice a year. The entire community had evacuation plans. They knew where to go. They knew how to get there. They had changed their egress and access routes to accommodate for the entire community evacuating at the same time. Uh, they didn't account for telephone poles catching on fire and falling across the road to uh, bar egress and also 75 fire department vehicles trying to get up the mountain while you know 800 residents are trying to get down the mountain yep. and 85 people perished in that event it was the single most destructive wildfire in California's history um, and you know we knew we have all of the data. We know what things increase risk in wildfire areas. We know fuel has to be present and an ignition source has to exist. Um, and we know what things exacerbate that loss. But to date, we haven't done anything to really incorporate all of that information and all of that fire science into insurance. And I think Black Swan's goal is to make wildfire assessment more transparent and to help people predict the unpredictable and prepare for an unthinkable event like the paradise fire. Yeah. So um, I, I was actually surprised when you brought that up, um, how prepared they were. So that that's not something that was readily available in the news. It was mostly, you know, mostly a lot of, um, negative information that's being spread around a lot of clickbait yeah. articles about that and how the industry reacted. But this is, this was a community that was highly prepared and just still was uh, caught with caught. Um, right. um, and a couple of key things that people yeah. didn't think about ahead of time. Was, um, the fact that the community by and large used PVC at the spigot. So um, when the fire entered the community and melted the PVC pipes, all of those spigots became open and all of the hydrants then lost pressure. 
And so all of the fire departments holding their hoses and, and pointing at the fire and then instantaneously all of that water pressure is gone. And so, and the benzene that was released from the PVC um, melting actually contaminated all of the city's pipes and all of the city's water is wow. now, it's not potable. Even today, May 2020, the city does not have water. The residents there can't drink the stuff that comes out of their faucet. They can't shower in it indoors. It's just, it's ridiculous the impact that it has and how laissez-faire we kind of are with the whole peril in the industry. It's, we've spent much more attention on things like flood and hurricane. And I think um, it's time that we put that focus on wildfire. Yeah. Um, in hindsight, I, I I like to think uh, from a market perspective that if we could put a price tag on that risk, like the real risk, and put an appropriate price tag, you get the you'll get uh, an appropriate reaction from the market. And in hindsight, from what you've seen, um, was the insurance that was provided to uh, the property owners of that community? Do you think it was appropriate pri appropriately priced? Was it subsidized oh, at well, all? If you had to reprice it, would the, would the price have been dramatically higher? Oh God, yeah, not even close to appropriately priced. I think that what they're saying um, publicly is that for every dollar of premium spent or purchased, you know, in 2018, a dollar and seventy was spent in losses on wildfire. So for every policy that they sell with wildfire coverage, they lose twice that, basically. Wow. And if the insurance industry were to be adequately priced, they basically would need to triple their premium. Now that sounds like an insurmountable thing, but that's to price the wildfire exposure as it exists today. Yeah. What if we were to mitigate that risk? What if we were to take the information that we can gather from wildfire models and apply that the same way that FinTech applied um, in, you know, the mycreditreport.com to help people improve their credit score? Yeah. What if we provided a wildfire assessment that was um, kind of a checklist for customers on things to change to reduce their risk? And now all of a sudden there's less risk and the premiums won't have to be triple, maybe, maybe double. Maybe what they are today is enough if we take the right action. Uh, let's talk about that. What would they have to do? And, and I'm assuming you're talking both about individual property owners and communities yes. uh, as well. Because given Paradise's location, there's probably only so much an individual property owner could have done right. um, given what was around it. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what are some of the mitigative effect, uh, mitigative uh, solutions to try to mitigate the effects of wildfire for, for some of these communities. And, and also go into it, whether this type of mitigation would work in other parts of the country, because this is not just a California problem. Right. So uh, at Black Swan, we like to think of it as a four-pronged approach. We've actually filed a patent um, for our wildfire model because it provides the detail in these four categories. And, and that is fuel. Well, you need fuel for a wildfire to burn. So one of the things that you can do to mitigate your risk is to reduce the fuel or change the fuel. Um, and ignition sources is the second thing. So we said there were three things that you need for a wildfire to exist, and that's fuel, ignition, and oxygen. So the second thing a customer can do to reduce their hazard would be to reduce the ignition sources. Um, you know, if there's a campfire outside or not allowing fireworks or not allowing um, wood burning fire stoves, um, things of that nature. And then there are other things that you can do to reduce the susceptibility of your house. Things like closing your eaves and changing your roof from wood shake to, to metal, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other things that you can do to make it easier for the fire department to protect your house. So the hazards, um, can they get in and can they get out? Do they have water available? What type of fire department is it? Um, are there dead end roads in the neighborhood? Is it gonna be difficult for them to get to your location? 
Is it possible that they get stuck someplace where they can't turn around? All of those things impact the the loss or the you know the risk of having damage. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is is it possible for a community like Paradise that, in hindsight, it is essentially uninsurable? In that, um, given its location in in such a rural area, that um, the 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 risk of the hazard is just always going to be at a such a highly elevated level that the cost with trying to mitigate it might just be too much of a burden for the community. Do you do you have do you get that sense at all? I I honestly I don't think. I don't think so. I don't okay. think wildfire is uninsurable. I think given the current construction, um, you know, and the current mitigation and the current, um, you know, the proximity to fuel that these houses are sometimes built without construction features that take into consideration the risks that are inevitably going to be coming their way. Uh, I think if we did a better job of mitigating and building and protecting and understanding wildfire risk, it would absolutely be insurable. And I mean, by insurable, you just want it to be, you don't know when a loss is coming, but you know that it can happen. And so it's easy to estimate what's the impact if that happens. And then the question is really just what frequency. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you know, do you know if the paradise community is looking to, uh, repopulate the area? Yes, they are. They're rebuilding and they're selling the homes. And if you purchase a home, you have to be willing to uh, repair it and make it a fire hardened, a fire safe home. So how do you do that? Uh, well, there's, I mean, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it has to be some sort of like concrete shell or something like a, just a wood structure uh, as as much as it's inex it's less expensive, um, just almost seems like you're inviting like another destructive fire if if one ignites on that particular property. So you would almost want to build the entire structure in non combustible material. Absolutely, yes. And if you have combustible material, it has to be protected by something that's not combustible. So, you know, if you have a frame built house, you need to cover it with stucco or with bricks so that it's not flammable. Yeah. And if you have some material that is combustible, you need to make sure that it's not possible for anything that can ignite to get near it. So if you were to have a frame home in the middle of the forest and you cleared the forest for 500 feet or 1,000 feet on either side, you know, then you could argue that, you know, maybe now it's not uninsurable. So depending on the area determines how much fuel you have to clear. Yep. But it's definitely, it's not one or the other, it's a combination. And um, I think, you know, we've come so far with building codes and everything. I think they absolutely have it down. What we need to do with the building structure and the construction types to protect a home from wildfire. It, when, when I think of different natural catastrophes and I think uh, it, it just, it becomes so obvious when you've seen building codes, proper building codes go into effect. It becomes obvious when you can see the difference that the building codes have made. And I point to, and I think the, the one natural hazard that's had the most uh, eyeballs on it when it comes to building codes are uh, hurricanes, especially in Florida. And so Florida building codes, I, the home I live in, uh, as I walk around it, uh, this home was built in the um, mid 2000s. The home is obviously um, masonry or concrete, like it is a fortress. And the way they build it, you can tell the entire structure was built to withstand significant wind. It was just built that way. And we we've seen with Hurricane Irma and now and then Hurricane Michael, which was a Category Five hurricane that made landfall in the panhandle which has slightly different building codes than southern florida you see how much of an impact building yeah. codes make when it comes to the ability for the community to bounce back from it and i feel like almost every other type of uh peril has suffered 
a little bit. It's just it's just they're almost like a decade or two behind catching up to what Florida has done with building codes. Uh, where do we stand with building codes when it comes like I would guess that the state of California is probably at the leading edge um, in in drafting um, more progressive building codes. But where do we stand and where do we need to go when it comes to building codes uh, in in California, but across the country when it comes to wildfire? It's funny. Um, that's a really good question because we've in 2009 and in 2012, we changed building codes and they basically are what we need them to be to protect from wildfire but they're only affecting new builds. Right. There's no enforcement and no retro fitting or anything on structures that existed before the new codes were established. And what kind of complicates things more is that there aren't any benefits to consumers to retro fitting their home for wildfire from yeah. an insurance perspective. And I think here's where wildfire is very different from hurricane because hurricane, you can fix your home and make it hurricane proof. And I think, you know, as long as it's built to establish a Cat 5 hurricane, it should be able to withstand a Cat 5 hurricane. And the neighbor's property really has no bearing on the survival of your home. In wildfire, it's not that case. And so you can do everything you need to to harden your home and protect it from wildfire. But if your neighbor is growing brush for a hobby, you're going to have a problem there. And so I think the challenge here becomes how do you get your, your neighbors to mitigate? How do, you, how do you motivate the entire community to, to mitigate together? And I think insurance is really built from a different perspective where we're always thinking about spreading the risk. And if you look at a neighborhood that has high wildfire risk, most carriers are going to want to insure a very small percentage of that neighborhood. In fact, if there's any saturation at all, they'll start non-renewing to keep their penetration below 10% if possible. Um, but with wildfire, that might not be the smartest, might not be the smartest strategy, because if you can get the entire community to mitigate, if you insure nine out of ten of those homes and nine out of ten of them mitigate, then the chances of that community burning from a wildfire are greatly diminished. Yeah. And so I think um, what I, from from a mitigative standpoint, um, you've brought up a few things now. So we're talking older structures that aren't at the modern building code, but there's stuff that they can do. Right. Yes. So you talked about um, metal roofs. I'm assuming clay roofs would suffice as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Tile, concrete. Yeah. So uh, preventing the embers from en entering the eaves. Right. So there I know that there are very inexpensive uh, catchers. Uh, I don't know what they call them. Ember catchers that can okay. prevent the embers from entering the home uh, from the eaves. There's um, brush clearance. Right. When I start adding those things up, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking that's not that expensive. And no. I, you know, I brought up insurance as a sort of signaling tool in the marketplace to kind of tell you um, this is what the risk is. They're, they're, um, I'm a fan of potentially using insurance as the, as the tool that can potentially create the appropriate credits where, yes. where those things almost, the, the mitigation almost pays for itself in reduction of insurance premium. Why? Absolutely. Why is the industry not doing this? Or are they? Well, so great question. A couple of things. Um, some of the things that they can do to, I mean, I saw firsthand in Paradise when I went up there with the Western Fire Chiefs Association and toured the area and looked at homes next to each other where one had burned to the ground and the other one had sustained minor damage. And the home that sustained minor damage had metal screens. They had the the vents up below the eaves had been screened with like one eighth inch screen instead of one quarter inch screen. The, uh, the landscape had been cleared. They had no overhanging trees. There was no, um, they had a, a patio and an overhead and it had a window in it that had cracked and burned. Um, but none of the other windows had cracked. So I'm gonna assume they had dual pane windows as well. 
And so some, those are some of the things that were introduced in code in 2009 that, that customers can do to retrofit their homes to improve the protection. The problem is that the carriers aren't necessarily going to know that you've made those improvements. Okay. So the data that's available to carriers isn't at the level of detail of what type of window do they have or what type of screen do they have or how big is the screen on their window or do they even have screens. Um, and so that's one area of opportunity where I think there's a, you know, when carriers sell a policy, when a customer signs up online and they want to get a quote for their insurance policy, they don't want to spend an hour and a half answering a million not. questions. Yeah, and so course. carriers have, you know, over the years made the number of questions that they have to answer smaller and smaller and smaller. And now the when faced with the concept of having to ask 13 or 20 more questions to figure out the customer's wildfire risk, you know, they're, they're not really willing to make the process that more, much more complicated for 100% of the business when it really only affects 20 to 30% of the policy. Yes, yeah. So. Um, it, it, it almost requires a, a, a slightly, not even a tweak, so something a little bit more than that to the business model. Like there, there's data there. How do we collect it? And it all, it almost seems to me like Tammy, this would be an ideal situation for the community itself to sort of pull, uh, pull their resources together. Uh, similar to how um, homes in Alabama, I, I, communities in Alabama pulled their resources together to get to IBHS fortified home status, right. to get the win credit, it almost seems like there's an opportunity for the community to just say, listen, we understand what, what's going on here, but if we, we need a, a simpler way, an, uh, an efficient way, effective way to collect and gather all this information and feed it to insurance companies. But if you're going to do that, you might as well not go one by one, one property by one property. You might as well pull it all together and try to create like economies of scale uh, for the community itself. Yes. Um, have you heard of anything, anyone trying to do that or, or, or am I off base and there's something that I'm missing? No, you definitely hit, hit the nail on the head there. There are communities that have organized and gotten together and, uh, figured out what it takes to become what's called a firewise community. Uh, they they take all of the steps. They spend about sixty grand to get a community wide preparation plan. They implement the plan, and then the firewise um, folks certify that they've met all of the requirements, and then they become a designated firewise community. Um, and so carriers can identify FireWise communities and offer discounts to all of the homes that are inside of the FireWise community. However, companies that have done that have found that's not profitable because all of the, well, for several reasons, they think because all of the homes in there aren't FireWise. And so, you know, they're still having losses. I think just because it's firewise doesn't mean it's not going to have losses. It means it has a reduced exposure to yeah. loss. And, um, and it's not, it's not black or white, you know, it's great. To what extent has the community mitigated? Uh, and how do they account for that in their pricing or their underwriting? Yeah. And so that gets to black swan analytics. So, right. Uh, who are you working with and how are you working with them? So it's funny because I thought you were going to say, who are you working for? Because that's a question we ask ourselves all the time. Sure. I mean, that, that, that's essentially the question. Exactly. Right. Who so we customer? started off wanting to help carriers adopt the right wildfire models. And we've come to realize that carriers aren't necessarily interested in being right. They just don't want to be wrong. And so they don't have to be the smartest. They just have to be smarter than the next guy. And as long as that's the catalyst for change, the insurance industry is always going to lag. And so at Black Swan, we realized that it's going to make a lot more sense to go to the customer because the customers want to reduce their risk. They want to control the exposure and they're begging for more information. So our wildfire model will tell the customer, these are the 
20, 30, 40 things that contribute to your wildfire risk. These are the 20 things of yours that are really causing the exposure. And of those, here are the things that you can do to reduce your risk. And if you've done so, and if you're interested, we'd be happy to let your carrier know what your true wildfire exposure is. Provide them with our recommendation mitigations proof that you've taken the necessary actions. And if you can't get your underwriter to reconsider the information that we're providing, we'll reach out to the Department of Insurance for you and request their assistance. Yeah. So interestingly enough, there's legislation being proposed that will preclude carriers from non-renewing customers who have taken all of the steps that they can possibly take to harden their home. And so I think those are the things that are gonna be required to kind of force the change. Because yeah. once the statute changes and forces carriers to consider that information, customers will be more motivated to take those steps yep. and then they'll be recognized. Yeah, there's uh, definitely definitely going to have to be some sort of give and take. Um, but to me, the the insurance carrot just seems too juicy to not try to introduce into this because it 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 like I said, it could literally pay for itself, right? You do a mitigative made mitigative effort, it reduces the risk. The risk is reflected in the premium. That reduction in the premium essentially is financed. Right. The but from a carrier's perspective right now, reducing risk is uh, its not easy for them. They don't have policies all in one area, right? They've done their best to spread them out, you know, profusely across the state. And so they can't, they yes. can't very easily, okay, you know, but mitigate. I'm going to push back on this because I read your white paper. And okay. I got excited reading your white paper because on the first page, right in the introduction, um, as an executive at the California Fair Plan, you had specifically mentioned how surprised you were at these carriers that were non-renewing due to wildfire risk. And yet, according to your estimate, these were not high-risk properties. These were actually low-risk properties, which means they've, they completely misjudged that altogether. And so... That's that's one having worked at a carrier now and you as well who get sort of the um, the sludge post carrier when it shows up at the California Fair Plan because all of the carriers didn't want it. There's a I think there's just a native in in a inability for the carrier to tap their head and rub their bellies at the same time. <laughs> right, they're trying to run this business, but in order to run this business, they need an incredible amount of information. But the customer doesn't want to give them an incredible amount of information, so they're willing to make it easier for the customer to get in. But that has now negated their information edge, right? And right. so, they actually, when I read that, I was just like, carriers actually don't know what they're doing. No, no, that's a good point, and you know, it's cyclical. Right, and so they'll go the other way. Right now it's, so they used to be heavily underwriting, and then they started leaning more towards pricing. And now when pricing is starting to show its shortfalls, I think they're gonna head again towards underwriting. Um, and I mean, as you see the, the, the market pull back, right, and the capacity diminish, carriers are forced to start reducing exposure in high risk areas. Now, everybody defines a high-risk area differently, but most carriers are limited to zip code basis. So because of technology and their ancient systems, they can't identify any geography with any yeah. differentiator other than territory or zip code. And most of them have fewer territories than there are zip codes. So the smallest definition would be zip code. And oftentimes, this information comes from their reinsurer who says, you need to reduce your exposure in zip code, let's just say 90210. And, and the insurance company says, okay, I need to reduce it by 30% in 90210. What's the fastest, easiest way to do that? And they decide to non-renew all policies that are multiples of three. Right? If it's in 90210 and it's a multiple of three, it gets non-renewed. So they can't non-renew everything. 
and they can't decide what scenario is, so they pick some method sure. of getting sure. rid of a percentage of those customers. But the, uh, yeah, the, 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 so. the flip side to that, as you're, as you're talking, the flip side to that is that that cr obviously creates an enormous opportunity, right? They're, they're literally non-renewing high quality business uh, like not, not, let's use 90210 because that's Beverly Hills. So if they're non-renewing in Beverly Hills, that means a carrier that's coming in that's looking for market share can actually get a hold of low risk fire uh, business uh, in, prest in prestigious areas um, and get that market share probably pretty easily if those properties end up having to go to the fair plan. Yes, but they have to be better at identifying which policies are low risk than the income. Yes. Right. And so I think that's where the issue is. Until um, a model comes out that incorporates all of the risk factors that need to be included, even the new carriers aren't going to be able to say, you know, I want these three policies out of 90210 because the models aren't. Most models will tell you this neighborhood is bad or this zip code is bad. There aren't really any models out there that will tell you this house within this neighborhood yep. is bad. And I think that's where we need to get. Yep. And that's where you are, right? That's, yeah, that's where we are. That's yeah. the promise of Black Swan Analytics, correct? Yes. yes. Um, I use a lot more data. We, we ask about 40 questions. Yes. I think the, the provider that asks the most questions right now is at about 10 or 11. Uh, that's stark. It's frankly. quite a difference, yeah. And we found the more questions you ask, surprisingly, the closer your answer is to correct. <laughs> yes, yeah. Like, almost a um, you should have known this. As, as someone who makes a living uh, using and analyzing and um, living and breathing off of the results that come out of models. Um, I, I was pleased to read in your white paper uh, this quote, when faced with the question of whether to use a model for underwriting or for rating, a good rule of thumb is to price for everything that can be priced and underwrite for everything else. Yeah. Can you can you talk about that? Because there are probably there are probably a lot of people listening to this that are uh, in a model centric environment. What do you what do you mean when you say that? So first, let's talk about what we're able to price. Right. If we're able to price it, that means we should be able to price it accurately. So if we can price something accurately, it means there are enough of those risks that are similar that we can watch their performance over time and estimate what their expected performance is going to be. And if we can be accurate about that, then that's a good segment to price. If you, if you identify risks that don't fit into those groups and they maybe fit into a category with very few other risks, it becomes very difficult to predict what that price should be because you don't get enough data to kind of get a volume where you can be what's called statistically credible. And so the basically imagine you have all of your risks coming in and you're putting them in buckets and you can only put them in a bucket if the bucket's going to get full. And so let's say you can fill eight buckets. Well, that's going to give you eight price points. And so with the other two policies that don't fit in any of those eight buckets, you, you're just going to have to look at them and underwrite and, and just really scrutinize and decide individually for each one, whether they're something you want to write or not, knowing that there's a lot of risk in those two because either there aren't enough of them or their performance is really volatile. And so it just takes too many years to kind of get it right. I think a good example is, you know, we can predict um, expected wildfire losses in areas where there are a lot of homes and a lot of history. But if you look at, you know, you build a new home in the middle of Sierra Nevada National Forest, uh, you know, chances are you're not, you're not going to feel real good about your ability to price that thing. And so maybe you, you be better off looking at underwriting. Yeah. And through underwriting, you can introduce risk mitigation. So you can tell the customer, we'll take this if you 
do these three to five things to kind of reduce your exposure because now it's starting to look a little bit more like bucket number seven. So I think for the most part, we try to create as many buckets as we can. And we have to recognize not everything is going to fit in a bucket and we need to know what to do with those. Uh, I, I love the way that you describe that. And um, because it's, it's uh, there's too much of a it, how do i phrase this i see this in flood where um a lot of folks that i'm competing with all they all want the low risk business and there's not enough of it for everybody and the activity of going after it means that you're not going to be able to fill your bucket right. and, and it also means there's not going to be any margin there because everyone's going to reduce their price and so it's, um, as you described, it's going to be very easy for things to go wrong because if you can't fill the bucket with what you're perceiving to be the low risk stuff, um, you, you may not be able to hit the number in the right way. And so you could, you could have a, um, a, just a, mi a misfortune of a loss that kind of throws it all out of whack and it's not the low risk bucket that you thought it was. Right. Um, and, and if like you think that. about buckets, it kind of is a good segue into, you know, ISO's model has 30 buckets. Yep. But really, if you, if you were to run your book of business through ISO's model, you would find that 70% of your business fits in one bucket. 77 out of 10 policies are going to go into bucket number one. And everything else is going to go into nine other buckets. So what are the odds that you're going to have enough information in those nine other buckets to be able to price them correctly? You know, it's greatly diminished because you've got so many policies in bucket number one. And with 70% of your risks in one bucket, the chances of all of those risks being the same is almost impossible. Uh, at the fair plan, we did some extra digging and we found that the category of risk that has, it's called the category zero. Um, the fire line, it's a zero, but it doesn't mean zero risk. It just means it's the lowest score that they have. But we were able to identify an extra category that ISO uses that they provide it to the carrier, but they don't incorporate it into the fire line score. And if you look at a combination of those things, you can create what's called a true zero. Well, the fair plan filed it as what they called a true zero with the Department of Insurance. And they were able to show that about half of those zeros um, had zero risk, which means the other half didn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so half of the zeros really should be paying some premium and, and half of the zeros shouldn't. And so um, just by introducing another factor, they were able to create um, greater homogeneity and increase premiums on people who they had thought were zero risk. But, you know, by charging... 50% of your customers, 15 to $18 for wildfire. You don't have to charge the ones with high risk, 10,000, right? Because you can spread that risk in a much more meaningful way. Yeah. So it became a really important differentiator for the firm. I, I wanna thank my friend, Bob Frady, for making sure I got that question into the agenda, zero versus true zero. Yes. So, so now we know. And um, I'm wondering, does, how does your model handle, we've spent a, almost the entire uh, uh, recording here talking about residential properties. What about commercial properties? So commercial is interesting. Um, you know, they have the same exposures, right? Mm -hmm. it's all the same stuff causes wildfire. And commercial, because the premiums are so high, they're able to spend a lot more money on underwriting expense. And so if a uh, commercial policy comes through with a $20,000 premium, the underwriter can actually sit aside for an entire day and look at that policy and assess all of its exposures and include all of these things that contribute to fire science. So they can look at the ease and they can look at the fuel and they can include all of those things in their underwriting and make the right selection. In personal lines, we haven't had that capability simply because the premiums are too low and the underwriting expense so controlled because of the competitive marketplace that identifying the risk has to kind of be instantaneous and automated. 
And so personal lines needs a very quick, very cheap yep. um, way of assessing risk. And commercial, they don't really have that same challenge. And you don't find as many commercial buildings in wildfire areas as you do personal lines. And when you do, those buildings have taken great, um, made great effort to mitigate their exposure. So, you know, they've got the external sprinklers and because their business is worth so much, it makes sense to them to build in the mitigation. When you look at a $5,000 piece of property on a homeowner, you know, it's not really feasible for them to install a 10,000 gallon water tank that can just be open and even offer. I mean, they just, from a cost basis, they just can't take the same mitigation that commercial businesses can. Yeah, I, I'm uh, in, a, in a prior job podcasting when um, I actually got to interview a retired MIT engineer who built, who was building, uh, designing, and looking to industrialize external sprinklers. And I thought there was so much potential there. Um, have you seen or heard of anyone tr attempting to do that where there are external uh, sprinklers that can be turned on, the, re the resident can leave, and it basically creates a fine mist fog um, yes. sur surrounding the home that um, basically becomes like a, um, a shield um, yep. as embers are trying to land on it. It's just like soaking the home. Um, any thoughts on that? Oh, that's one thing that they do. They're actually doing that. And there are other things that they can do, like they have a fire retardant. So if there's a wildfire in the area, they'll spray this fire retardant over all of their property and their home, and it will protect it from catching fire. Yeah. So at the fair plan, we had a couple of customers call and try to report that as a claim because they spent $3,000 spreading all of their stuff to protect from the fire, and it didn't come. So now they're $3,000 out. They got no more no more flammable material for the next wildfire, but their house wasn't damaged. So there isn't a loss. Was it covered? So, so it wasn't covered. No, it wasn't covered. But it um, should be covered. Like, I don't know. I, I think to me, to me, Tammy, that seems like the perfect opportunity where you have, um, should a flag go up like a, a, a red flag warning and the property owner does the right thing. Right. So the incent now you have an alignment of incentives between insurance carrier and property owner. They both want no fire, <laughs> and they go through that extra expense effort for no fire. I think within the policy there should be built in. If you do, if you take these steps, you will be reimbursed for it. Let's, I, I, mean, I, I have a feeling we're going to be talking offline about this. Well, you could do that, but it would make the policy a lot more expensive. I think one way that the industry has kind of tried to address that is with parametric insurance. Mm -hmm. So they say if there's a wildfire and it's designated, I mean, they do it with hurricane and stuff, but hypothetically, we could do it with wildfire and say, if there's a wildfire that hits anything in your zip code, we'll reimburse you for the cost of spreading your flame retardant. So that could be a separate policy that they buy to kind of protect them against using that stuff haphazardly because we don't want them to have it and not use it right because they're afraid of using it without needing it exactly. and, they, long and, and yep. they perish so i i definitely see your point it's the uh to me it's like that's the um the 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 central problem we're actually trying to solve in insurance is alignment of interest yes and yes. so since the beginning of insurance there's been the components of fraud and other things so we've, you know, we've introduced concepts like deductibles and other ways to, to it's, um, you know, it, unfortunately, that's why there's a lack of trust between uh, policyholders and carriers is over time, there's been that conflict. Right. Where, we're not um, bad actors have done certain things and the insurance companies have had to respond um, in, and other ways. This is that seems like the one area where it's like we are both on the same side here. So let's exactly. let's do the right thing. But I think that that's going to be um, a conversation you and I have offline. Um, but this is this was a fantastic. Uh, hopefully for the audience, they got a really good uh, 101 on wildfire. 
and some of the things that are happening. And um, can we make that white paper available uh, to to the audience if they yes. if they like? Yes, I can. Can I should I just send it to you, or do you want me to post it? Um, I'll, we'll figure I'll, out a way. We'll we'll figure out a way. So, okay. so, so uh, for those that are listening, we'll give you access to the Black Swan Analytics uh, white paper on Wildfire. We'll make it available in the show notes somehow. And along with connections to Tammy, to Black Swan, the transcripts, um, all of that, uh, please, please subscribe. Um, if you're on, we're on YouTube and uh, the audio version is on all of the uh, common uh, podcasting sites. So please subscribe. But other than that, um, we're still in pandemic mode. So I'm going to exit out by reminding you, um, do the smart thing, wear your masks, wash your hands, disinfect, be a good citizen. It's not that big a deal. It's really not that big a deal. So we can all do this. So please do that. And to my guest, Tammy Schwartz of Black Swan Analytics, thank you so much for coming on and educating us on wildfire. Thank you, Nick. It was a pleasure. Okay. I'm going to take Here's... my coat and hair. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have competition. We're going to have competition. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much, Tammy. All right. Take care. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream.